Hello guys, thank you very much for watching this video. So as, prom as promised, I'm continuing with the CISSP course and tips. So I would like to make sure that it is very helpful for you. So we're going to address the remaining four domains this time. And I will also point out some of the most important tips that I consider are important for your preparation. So keep tuned, get rested well and get yourself ready for a lot of new information. So hello again and we are continuing with the CISSP tips part 2 or the CSSP course that I promised to continue the last time and we are going to address actually two domains. When I come back to that, just make sure that you actually answer the requirements requested by ISC Square to be certified. I just want to make sure that you are ready for that and that you understand that you need a hands-on experience of any of the eight domain or at, and at least four to five years of practical, again, hands-on experience. So make sure that you have that and then make sure that you prepare your exam well. So I was supposed to actually continue with four domains this time, but I will go with two domains. First, identity and access management, as well as security assessment and testing. And then for the next time, maybe next week or in a couple of next weeks, I will actually address the two last domains, security operations and software development security. So before starting with the new domains, I actually found a very interesting exercise, which I would like you to answer. So try to classify each of the following attacks based on what they actually impact. How do they impact confidentiality, integrity, or availability, or maybe some of them, or maybe all of them? So just make sure that you understand this concept. It is very important. And try to post the answers on the list as a comment so I can actually check if all is clear and we can talk about it and discuss eventually some other clarifications. So looking forward for your answers. So let's start with identity and access management. So identity and access management will address different points, including identity and access management um, with the identification mechanism, the authentication factors, the password, protocols, and as well some details about how to defend yourself for against access control attacks. So let's start with the beginning. Access control is one of the main aspects and key aspects of security. In fact, whenever you have assets and data that you classify, you know which data you need to protect. And in order to proceed to the protection, you need to make sure that you actually have a clear access control strategy and therefore you might define who access to which data and if that subject has access to that object. And we will address as well this kind of concept. So whether or not the request is accepted, it still depends on the access control that you put in place. And of course, it also depends on your classification that will be done by the um, data owner. But first main point that you need to remember, access control is a must for your cybersecurity strategy or your security strategy. So let's come back to identification and authentication. I mentioned previously what both concepts mean, but let me come back to that. So identity, you must represent any subject and define the identity of the subject. Then, of course, when the subject is identified, you must authenticate the subject. And this occurs when a control provides proof that the user possesses the identity that he or she claims, as an example, a password. So then the identification and authentication are definitely very important steps in order to proceed for the access control. Therefore, if you cannot identify a subject and authenticate him, you cannot proceed 
with actually the next step to make sure about your decision. Do you grant the access to the object or do you refuse the access for that subject or individual? And here is actually the most common uh, authentication methods, like for example, biometrics, uh, passwords, passphrases, uh, passwords twice, <laughs> visibly, uh, I didn't see that I put it already, and one-time password as well, OS or a token. So mention that again, but remember, a user must be authenticated by something that he knows or something that he has or something that he is. And of course, the most, uh, I would say, practical approach is to use multi-factor authentication and basically using two of the authentication methods to authenticate your subject. And when we talk about authentication and we talk about biometric sensors, it is important to understand that they will not give you uh, error-free results. There will be some false positive and false negative. So it is important to know whenever you choose any uh, biometric security device to take a look at the error rate. And there are two types of errors. So the false accept rate is called type 2 error and the false reject rate is type 1. So let's say an employee wants to enter to the office but he got denied access with a fingerprint device. That means that it's a false reject and therefore it comes under type 1 error. The best uh, devices are usually known as being and having a cross over rate that is similar with a type 1 error and type 2 error are almost the same. Therefore, you can at least have a device that gives you some real reliability when it comes to these errors. So when you identified and you authenticated the user, the next step is actually authorization. The access control is all about defining who has access to an asset, a data, and who doesn't. So the authorization step will allow you to decide and do define which actions you or the user is allowed to do on what resources. And of course, this needs to be defined from the beginning in the policies of the companies. And then it can be authorized through different, def, uh, different access control techniques that we're going to see in a bit. And this will actually give the third and last step. So first, you need to identify the user. Second, you need to authenticate the user. And third, you need to authorize, authorize the user. Either he has or he does not have access to the resource, to the data, to the asset. So access control will allow you to define the mechanisms, how and services, how, whether, to accept or deny requests to access, as mentioned, to your assets, data, uh, that is also an important asset, and most of the time nowadays is the most important within the companies. And as mentioned, this requires the three most important steps before granting the access or denying the access to the subject. First, identification second authentication and third authorization then it comes to the decision or actually implementing the authorization are we accepting or denying the request of the subject and the access control as i mentioned is not always enough to mention it is a must in information security first again clear vision you need to classify your data classify your assets and then you define which kind of access control will we will you be using in order to grant or deny access to your assets and data therefore is actually all relying also on the information owner classification 
It is important also to remember the information owner defines the classification. What that means? It means that the owner will tell you if a document is classified or is confidential. And the owner will tell you if the document is actually public. So this is important to remember for the exam as well. Then the custodian will implement the right controls in place. So a data custodian as actually is a person that will, who will have a very technical control over the information assets. So this is something that also remember for your exam and make sure that you understand the roles and responsibilities for the information owner, as I mentioned, and the data custodian. And usually this person has root uh, level access. So that means that they have a very high level in terms of rights and um, of course they can change and they can attribute the right controls for your data. So then let's get and look into the controls that we can put in place. We have administrative controls, we have technical controls and we have physical controls. They will all define different levels of access control to your assets depending on their type. The administrative access control will be defined by the management and as you can see in the graph it might be actually the policy. It is also the report reviews or maybe the employees contracts. So this is all and will be defined as administrative controls. The technical or logical controls are different controls and this ones actually will be related to as the name says technical controls for example um, the passwords that you put in place the tokens um, and they will probably put in place by the right technical team which actually will be for example the security information team they are also called logical controls as they use to restrict the access to objects so remember when we say technical we might say as well logical controls so this is important for the exams and they will protect as well the integrity and availability of resources by limiting the number of uh, individuals accessing to them and of course protecting the confidentiality as we said these are the main concepts of access control and then the third one, which is actually the physical access control, which supports the administrative and the technical controls, but it can be, for example, related to the fences, related to security guards at the entry of the buildings, uh, the gates, of course. So let's actually go a little bit more into details about these access controls. So the administrative controls, as mentioned, will be defined by the management. And this administrative controls can be policies, can be the standards defined for the companies, can be the procedures and guidelines, but also the personal screening. I put the image so you remember. Let's say, for example, the background checking of an employee is actually comes under administrative controls and also the defined contracts that the employee will sign for his employment. The one part that I really would like you to focus on and remember is awareness training. The awareness training comes also under administrative controls. So it is important for you to remember for the exam as well. The next one, as we mentioned, are the technical or logical controls. And one of the main examples that is also for your knowledge is actually network architecture, which comes under the technical logical control as well. Of course, as I mentioned, it includes also encryption, security devices like IDS, like firewalls, and also the identification and authentication part of it. So. Uh, make sure that you remember the technical controls and the different 
uh, types. The other technical control might be system access. For example, when it comes to implementing any technical um, approach or system access uh, measures, like for example, any kind of um, uh, let's say technical controls for systems like for example Kerberos, PKI, Rages. Uh, so these are actually authentication mechanism and therefore they are under the technical controls but also everything that's related to network access and therefore the control defines the access control to the network like for example I mentioned firewalls, switches, bridges um, whatever is related to this kind of things and encryptions and protocols which are as I mentioned part of it as well there's one important as well thing that you need to take in consideration apart network architecture is actually the auditing auditing comes under the technical control they help to point out the different vulnerabilities of the technical controls that someone or some company put in place so ex additional example access control lists as i mentioned alarms uh, alerts smart cards to make sure that you remember all these types and examples and the physical controls will actually will protect your buildings and put in place the right controls for your offices for example this includes uh, building protection, security guards, locks, monitoring, uh, data backups as well, and that is very important for the exam, remember. But as well, network segregation, perimeter security that actually includes building protection and the security guards as well, um, but it also includes CCTVs, which is important for you to remember as well in terms of for the exam and also the work area separation, the cabling, all this comes under the physical control. But please make sure that you remember that the data backups are under physical controls. There's actually a physical control to ensure that information is accessible if something happened, if there is an emergency, there is a disruption of business, and therefore you have access to the data. So we saw the three different access control types. We have what we said, the administrative, we have the technical, and we have the physical. And we have additional classification, which is related to different types. And here we go. So we have the discretionary access control, the mandatory access control, the non-discretionary access control, which is related to the role-based access control. So let me tell you more what it is about. In basically the discretionary access controls defines the subjects, the objects that actually allow subjects to have access and it is related to object and subjects so the object's access will and is restricted to identities of the subjects defined clearly so let's say for example if the folder accounting department will have a defined identity which is mark from the accounting staff and that will be only a only identity or only individual who will be uh, able to access the data then mark will be the person accessing the folder account of the accounting department and not anyone else so remember discretionary access control is related to object and it's related to subject so the access is restricted to the identity of the subject and the real person so in this case in our case it's mark from the accounting department then go, we go to the mandatory access control which is uh, and has been used very uh, initially by the military uh, and most mostly because it uses the security label system which is actually unclassified confidential secret and top secret we have addressed those previously 
just to make sure that you understand that's the classification for military services and not for commercial entities so in this case users have clearances and resources have security labels with the data classification as i mentioned so unclassified confidential secret and top secret are examples of classification so make sure that you understand and remember the mandatory access control it does use security label system and then as mentioned we have the third one which is non-discretionary access control and this one is based on a role-based approach to define the access control of the individuals. So let's say I have the accountant department and I have a folder that includes financial information of the company. I will define a rule that is based on the fact that anyone who is with them or has a role that is defined as an accountant will have access to that folder. Therefore, this is an example of a non-discretionary access control. Again, every accountant will have access to the financial accounting folder. That means that any additional person that comes on board within the company and has an accounting role will have automatically access to that folder. Then, Let's go a little bit more into details about the role-based access control, which is, as I mentioned, based on the roles of the individuals to give them the permissions to access to the assets. And of course, here we have different, definitely pros and cons of using this type of access controls. The pros will be that they are very easy to scale, flexible, and of course, as you define this access control by rules, therefore, there is a very less administrative tasks. And you usually, actually, the most common access control in, pl in place nowadays still remains the role-based access control. The cones will be, of course, the provisioning, uh, the maintenance, and the fact that also if someone leaves the company, um, there might be some dormant accounts still active. If there is, you know, it's based on rules and it's usually attributed to some groups, and these are the main aspects that companies will have to deal with. So, again, before going further, we have as we mentioned, administrative, technical, logical, and physical access control. Then we have discretionary, mandatory, non-discretionary based on role-based access control. Make sure you remember this concept and you understand what they're based on. An access control of course, as any other concepts in place have pros and cons, as I mentioned. And some of the main challenges when it comes again to role-based access control will be the manageability problems, uh, scalability sometimes. It depends on how many roles do you have, the granularity, which is related to the scalability. Let's say if you want to do uh, additional roles therefore the manageability will increase and the scalability problems as well uh, and as well the vocation as I mentioned and delegation so these are challenges keep them in mind they probably are not directly addressed within the exam but I wanted to share with you and this is a very nice example that I found of some of the exam some of the challenges that anyone can be I can go through when there is an access control in place. Let's say a patient go to a doctor and he asks that I do not want all my information to be shared with the researchers who are not HIPAA compliant. You, we know that uh, for researchers purposes, um, medical institutions anonymize the data of the patients and then they share them with other research labs in order to enhance the, um, of course, the findings and help us, uh, help us with the current disease. So this request of the patient asking to 
shared only with HIPAA compliance researchers might be a very big challenge. And why I'm putting that here is just to make sure that you understand how important is access control to the data. So before even just understanding the concept is also very important for you to understand the business have a clear classification of the data and understanding how will you take that step to decide which access control you will put in place and which kind of types of access controls as well so now let's go into additional classification of access controls because we have as i mentioned administrative logical, technical, and physical access controls. But then, these access controls are also defined in additional types. And the first one would be the preventive ones. That means that there will be the access controls controlling or with an aim to avoid something happening. And this can be, for example, security policies, that define or even a security guard that will not allow someone to get in. So it is preventive. The detective controls actually will help identify the events that happen and have occurred, like for example, tracking an authorized transaction, or actually as per the picture, tracking and exactly having the, mo the logs of what someone did in the office and all the motion detectors. Uh, so here we have the preventive, preventive controls with a security guard as an example and then we have the detective controls which are for example with a motion detection um, device. Then it's not the end, we have the corrective controls which actually they will try to solve or correct events that happened and a very clear example would be the antiviruses um, that is that are trying to correct for example putting your files infected files within current time and then you have the deterrent controls which are actually discouraging someone to do something an example uh, be aware of the dog that is a very common uh, you know way to actually try to discourage anyone to anyone to come into the building or into the office uh, and as well anything that's related to fence. The other last two ones are recovery controls uh, that helps you restore the activity let's say after a big um, fire and that an example can be an off-site facility. And then the compensative controls, which actually are just all related, as we mentioned before, the alternative ones. So remember, we have, and I will come back to it, we have preventive, detective, corrective, deterrent, and we have recovery and compensative controls. Make sure that you remember and you understand the difference between both. I want to make sure also that you remember the different examples again so now let's pass to a little bit more and see actually what Kerberos is about in how that works but before going into the main aspects of Kerberos let's understand what single sign-on single sign-on will allow user to get authenticated to different networks at the same time, or systems actually, with one ID and one password. An example, the, in the company, you have uh, your Windows session and then you have Microsoft Office 365. An example of single sign-on would be that you will use the same ID to your Windows device or laptop and the same password for your Microsoft Office 365 access or email. This is an example of single sign-on. And in order to have actually the possibility to that, to do that, there are different uh, protocols or authentication protocols. And one of the most known is actually Kerberos. 
the other one we're gonna talk about it in a bit but Kerberos is one of the most and most popular it is designed to provide strong authentication for client server applications and it is actually using a secret key cryptography so it is based based as well on a symmetric approach and this is a point that you need to understand as well a symmetric a symmetric uh, symmetric keys so what you need to remember is that Kerberos is based on the fact that it actually requires and trusts a key distribution center KTC and it does, as I mentioned, represent a client-server protocol. For the name Kerberos, if you're wondering what is that, and I have been reading about it uh, at the beginning, and I was like, what? So it is actually coming from a three-headed dog who guarded the gates of hate, and it comes from the Greek mythology. So definitely check it out. At least you remember Kerberos, three-headed dog. <laughs> but then... Again, the most important for you to remember is that it's used for single sign-on and that is very popular and that is requiring a symmetric, uh, symmetric keys in a client-server approach with a key distribution center that is actually a trusted third-party authentication service. So how that works and how the protocol works. So the process is actually based that on the first step, the client who initiates the request sends a request to an authentication server in order to access to the service. The initial request is sent with no encryption as there is no sensitive data included. And then the authentication server retrieves the initiating client's private key assuming that the the client's username of course is within the kdc database so remember what is kdc is actually the trusted third party authentication service Of course, if the client's name is not in the database, the client cannot be authenticated. But if the client's username is found in the KDC database, then the authentication server will generate a session key and a ticket, granting ticket. So it's called TGT. Make sure you remember that. So the first step, the user is sends actually a request it's not encrypted and then if the user exists within that database the second will be actually the generation of the session key and the tgt then the tgt is actually time stamped as well and encrypted by the authentication server with the initi initiating password of the user so make sure you remember that first request is not encrypted second request is of course encrypted and it con contains as well the timestamp so if the password actually corresponds and is the right password therefore the encrypted ticket granting ticket sent from the authentication server is decrypted and used to request a credential from the ticket granting server ticket granting server so remember we have the kdc we have the tgt we have the tgs and we have like i mentioned the user then make sure that you remember key kdc tgt tgs they are main concept for the plot authentication protocol care barrels and you need to understand the different requests 
So, as mentioned, the encrypted ticket granting ticket sent from the authentication server is decrypted, used to request a credential from the TGS. And the client sends the ticket granting ticket to the ticket granting server. I think it's better when you look at the picture, isn't it? Yeah? <laughs> and then, of course, this uh, might be running on the same physical server, uh, hardware or not, but then the TGS carries out and does an authentication check, similar of the KDC that was done at the beginning. And actually, uh, this time sends credentials and a ticket to access the requested service. service. So, of course, here, as it's credential, it is encrypted with a session key specific to the user and the service being accessed. So, and this remains uh, and becomes a proof of identity. This timestamp ticket sent by the ticket granting service allows also the requesting system to access the service using the single ticket. So, and of course, that means that he cannot re be re-authenticated with the same ticket as it contains the timestamp. So again, try to remember all the steps and understand how this works. But most important is that again, you understand that there is a request, there is some requests that go unencrypted and some others that go encrypted, that the KDC is the third party trusted uh, server, that the, there is a ticket granting ticket generated and there is a ticket granting service as well that will end up to generate the different credentials and being encrypted. And what are the Kerberos strength? It's, as I mentioned, very common and is, has been used a lot. Uh, and currently, again, uh, the strengths are, and remember, Kerberos is client server, server, not server, a server uh, protocol. And this actually means that the client and the server need mutually to be authenticated. And as well, as well, the other part is that the user's password are not sent across the network and the secret keys are only passed encrypted and that was I was specifying for you. And the other protocol, authentication protocol that helps and is commonly used for SSO, which is single sign-on. Again, single sign-on, remember, you sign in in the different systems with the same ID and same password. And the CSAM, uh, probably I'm reading it uh, a little bit more in French, like CESAM, but it's actually the secure European system in a multi-vendor environment. And in differently from the uh, Kerberos, it's actually using symmetric and asymmetric encryption. So let's try to see how that works. So Kerberos versus Sesame, and I really like this picture. But remember, Kerberos using only symmetric, and Sesame is using both symmetric and asymmetric. So Sesame is actually similar to Kerberos, but has a lot of extensions to Kerberos. One important extension is that it supports role-based access control using privilege attribute server, which is actually highlighted here as a PAS, so remember that. And how it works is actually in Sesam, you have several architectural components. You have the domain security server, DSS, which actually uh, consists of three online security servers, AS, which is in the scheme, PAS, so AS is the authentication server, PAS we mentioned is a privilege attribute server, and key distribution server is KDS. So again, you have Sesame is based on a domain security server, DSS, and you have AS, PAS, KDS, KDS. So then you have the public supporting server, which is actually contains local registration authority, certificate authority agent, offline certificate authority, 
We have three generic security components, which are actually public key management, cryptographic support facility, and audit facility. So all this is very important, but basically what happens is that you have the initiator of the request and you have the target. And the difference between Kerberos and Sesame is that here is actually the initiator. Initiator will be the user. So let me come back a little bit maybe and give you here more details about how that works. So first of all, you have the user who is actually the client will go through the authentication and privilege attribute APA and we send a request to the authentication server AS. Then the AS will reply. Then you have the initiator which actually will go to a secure association context management manager and the what is called the SACM the SACM will send a request to privilege attribute server PAS the PAS will actually check the security management information base and if that of course is present as uh, similar to Kerberos the request will be sent back to PAS which actually will send back also to SACM the Secure Association Content Manager, or SACM, will send a request then to Key Distribution Server, KDC, and then KDC will send back and therefore we'll see if the client has access to the client application and the target, which is actually the target application. So I definitely advise you here, I give you very high level of how that works, but I, I definitely advise you to just go through the uh, to any diagram that will give you much more understanding of how it works. You need to understand how are the different steps and what are the difference again between Kerberos and Sesame. So let me come back to that. Uh, sorry. So here is Kerberos versus Sesame. So as we said, one is using only symmetric cryptography, the other one is using symmetric and asymmetric. But as well, Kerberos aims specifically at Unix systems, um, which is something to know. And Kerberos only supports secret keys and Sesam support public keys for validation and into realm security. Uh, and I have been mentioning that a lot, but just keep it in mind for the exam. And then, of course, uh, also the other part is that Sesam uses role based uh, distributed access control with an option to delegation of access right which is not available under Kerberos. You have been doing a great job so now just take a break go for a dance or go for a drink a movie and come back for the next two domains that we are addressing. It's a lot again of information so make sure that you actually are well rested that is extremely important even before the exam so see you soon now let's pass to the next domain you have done great uh, following until now so let's pass to the security assessment and testing and i really like this part of this domain it's something that i have been working on on a regular basis on a daily basis so let's go through that and it's for you uh, a very discovery part uh, again make sure that you go into the details with the official books or you just read on the internet the maximum that you can so first of all, the domain includes uh, valid design and validation of the assessment, as well as the test strategies, the vulnerabilities assessment, the penetration testing, the log reviews, uh, the code reviews as well, the misuse case, and uh, of course, the reports as well. So let me go through that with you. So first of all, before going into the different testing, I would like to highlight this part. You're probably very aware of it, but just to make sure that we understand the, the different techniques of accessing a system without authorization would actually commonly means today hacking. You have the traditional hacking and you have the social engineering hacking. So the traditional hacking means that you actually get your technical knowledge and you penetrate the systems and the network through the network only. 
The social engineering will allow you to gather the information from the employee or maybe actually to retrieve the employee and just get access to the network and systems through the employee rather than the uh, systems. And it's very important to understand this once before pro proceeding with any testing or reviews of the current systems. So again, social engineering is something that has been put in place um, very often nowadays and it's getting more and more attractive for the cyber criminals and you don't like want to say hackers uh, hackers might be just very good technically it does not not mean that they are criminals so let's say the cyber criminals and then you have social engineers who are using and the, the, the definition here that I mentioned is social engineering is an art and why do I say that is because obviously it does require some uh, artistic skills like really being geared in anything that is theater <laughs> for the fun of it but it is like that so social engineering is actually an attack that will manipulate the user to get and access confidential information and when you look at this at it nowadays what happens is for the big attacks um, commonly what happens is that they the cyber criminals will try to get information and social engineer the executives of the companies in order to get the confidential information and then of course attack the company that will allow them to really like gain a lot of time and of course uh, get to the target much more quicker than just trying for two years like for example the bank of bangladesh it took two years for them to actually get to the target and get what they wanted to achieve and basically do the transaction. And most commonly social engineering scenarios, which but this ones are very common, so you probably got some of them, but just to understand, it's like impersonating someone important as a CEO, and that means like, for example, sending uh, emails saying that, oh, I am the CEO, I'm flying, I'm, I'm gonna miss my flight, please make this transaction immediately to this bank account. This happens very often, and it's a clear example of social engineering, but as well entering to a building saying to the security guard, oh, I'm running late to the CEO's meeting without giving the identity card to the guard, security guard is also a social engineering uh, technique. Uh, one that is also interesting and can happen to any one of us is actually uh, an email, let's say, with some information about a car accident and pretending to be the spouse of your spouse, for example. And because of the urgency or the sense of urgency, uh, a lot of people do not check even the email. And then, so now that you, we have a clear understanding of all this kind of attacks, and how do they come from that this is the next point which is very important before launching any web application before going public before putting out all the networks of the companies out there is actually to have the right security assessment and this security this security assessment allows companies or allows any uh, i would say a business owner web application owner to have a clear view an overview of all the securities vulnerabilities of the systems applications and other environment that they are using there are no systems and applications with no vulnerabilities at all they are vulnerabilities you just need to make sure that you assess them in order to mitigate them and security assessment can be done on different levels as I mentioned before going public for, for example, for a web application and of course on a regular basis to make sure that uh, you tackle the new vulnerabilities that come on over the time and that happens with, for example, zero days uh, vulnerabilities as well. That means that there is a requirement to do the assessment on a regular basis. Again, I'm repeating myself, make sure that you remember that not only for the exam. And then the security actually, and I would say the security reviews and assessment includes as well the audits. But what does it mean? It means that you can do a vulnerability scans, you can do a review of security settings, a policy review and a risk assessment, but you can do additional things like what we call penetration testing. So let's go through these details and as 
what is required for you to understand for the exam. So just audits. You have, and I really like this picture, but you have audits, internal audits, and you have external audits, and they are not the same. Of course, we know and we're probably, and you are as well, very familiar with external audits where you hire a third party to assess your systems. And what is the difference between internal and external audit is that the internal audit will be appointed by the management, it will be within the company, the scope will be different, and as well, the objective will be to help in risk management and adding some value. It will be reporting as well to the audit committee. It will not have the same scope as an external audit, with the scope of the external audit will be specified in terms of references. It will be signed uh, by, of course, the management. It will be appointed as well before even starting that. The auditors will be appointed by the shareholders. The objectives will be actually to report on exactly the uh, let's say the truth and fairness, for example, for the financial statements, and here we're talking about financial, but actually to report on the security vulnerabilities. And I gave you just an example of this, um, which is related to general um, definition of internal and external audits, but it's for you to see the difference between both. And of course, the interest for both are not the same. The internal audit might actually be more into enhancing the systems, while the external audit might be more into finding the vulnerabilities and having a non-bias as well uh, feedback. And let's start with the vulnerability scan. So vulnerability scan is actually uh, a check, a simple check of the systems, the applications, the networks, looking for the vulnerabilities that might be exploited by the cyber criminals. So you need to remember the differences between all the concepts that we'll be talking about. Vulnerability scans, first one. And vulnerability scans uh, are actually also commonly called security testing tools. Make sure you remember that as well, security testing tools. Usually they are automated as well and very easy to implement. Then you have network discovery scanning. What that means? There means that actually you discover what is under your network. And the network discovery scanning is actually usually using some network discovery software that are programs that facilitate the detection of all the vulnerabilities. Then you can have different uh, scanning, the active one, the passive one, and the notable one. Um, actually, sorry, just the active scanning and the passive scanning. So the active scanning is done through sending multiple props requests and recording the response. The passive scanning is not done by active probing, but by listening to any data sent out, which is really different. So make sure you understand that there are two kind of things, so passive and active. Um, for the network discovery scanning. And the first one actually is TCP connect scanning, which is actually the, the I would say the common scanning, which uh, will scan the ports and will attempt to establish a complete connection with different ports that are open. So the connection will be established to the port with a complete three-way handshake exchange. So this is an important point, and we will come back to that. So an attacker actually might get information using about the firewall, about the access control list, using the TCP ACK scanning, which actually this will be uh, or the objective will be to discover more information about the configurations rather than the port state. And this is used not as commonly as the other, but when combined with the SYN scanning, it gives a complete, of course, picture of 
the uh, the type firewalls of uh, type of firewall rules that are used and when this attack the signal is sent to a closed port or sent out of sync to a listening port then the expected be behavior for the device is to respond with an rst getting rsts back in response to an ack scan gives the attacker very useful information and he can use them to infer of the type of firewall rules so it is all about what both attacks a scan sorry can actually achieve and why they are used by the attackers so just for your information the stateful firewalls will discard out of sync ack packets uh, leading to no response when this occurs actually the port is marked as fil filtered and where when the rsts are received in response the ports are marked as unfiltered as the ack packets uh, solicit, solicit the expected behavior so make sure you understand both of them tcp connect scanning and tcp ack scanning they both not gathering the same information the TCP connect will try to find and gather the information about the open ports and try to establish a connection and the TCP ACK scanning will actually try uh, to find more information about the firewall rules in order to change them later on. And the third one which is actually the Christmas scanning uh, and this is easy to remember because it's Christmas and we are in November and in Singapore we have already Christmas decorations so just remember on that but this one is actually used differently it is actually scanning um, the name actually comes from the set of flags that are turned on within a packet and actually what the scan do is that uh, they manipulate the PAC H U R G and F E I N flags or the TCP header. So they basically manipulate the information within the header and when viewed after they can get some like really uh, good information for the next step. So what is important for you to remember is that the Christmas scanning actually were popular because they were speed more faster than the other one, so because of the speed, but also because actually they could bypass stateless firewalls and access control list filters. So remember that this is important for your exam and for your known. Uh, your own uh, actually knowledge but again try to remember the differences between the tcp connect scanning the tcp ack scanning and the christmas scanning and then the other part that is actually the tcp syn scan is actually that this one sends the syn packet sync packet uh, and receives back a sync acknowledge packet it does not send the final acknowledge so just make sure that also you understand this one and actually this uh, just to make sure that you understand the difference between this one and the previous one this one will try to establish a connection with every single port um, and this is actually one of the let's say the the oldest uh, the oldest techniques that have been put in place for the attackers but is commonly also used for uh, denial of services so again here the the client will try to uh, set up the connections with the server at every possible port and this is done by sending the syn packet the sync packet and then as if it's initiating three-way handshake to every port of the server of course the server will if the server responds to uh, with an acknowledgement um, with a sync acknowledgement packet uh, then it means the port is open 
but then the client the, the, the actually the requester the criminal the attacker will send an RST reset packet and then as a result the server assumes that there have been no communication so that's why here it's important for you to remember that and it does not send the final acknowledgement because of that now let's go to uh, the very famous uh, software that is used uh, for the uh, tool that actually is used for network discovery scanning. It's an open source tool that's called Nmap, and I think you probably, even if you are not very technical in cybersecurity, probably heard about it. It's very commonly known, and it allows to have a really very good network discovery scan with all the different ports as you can see in the uh, in the uh, picture uh, the service and the version so it's really very very interesting when it comes to network discovery scanning so now let's move to the network vulnerability which is different so the network discovery will allow you to have a high level visibility of what ports are open uh, what ports are accessible, maybe eventually what are the firewall rules, uh, but still it remains high level. The network vulnerability scan will actually scan a little bit more in depth the network and than the previous one and give you some additional vulnerability. So when it comes to that, it makes it, it means that as parallel the exam or in general you need to make sure that you actually know the common ports and all these numbers are actually uh, the ones that are used the most commonly and one of the techniques that is used also to avoid attacks is actually to use services with uncommon uh, uncommon port numbers of course that means that you that doesn't mean that you will avoid completely the attack but at least you make it harder for the attacker eventually if you are targeted and if he's not scanning all the ports uh, to reach to his target and make sure that you remember these ports for the exam there are questions uh, with them requ requiring at least that you know the, the common ones and when it comes to ports why i mentioned that of course when it comes to network discovery and as well uh, network um, network uh, vulnerability scans that means that it will find vulnerabilities and open ports mean security risk so if there is open ports that means that you are exposing your network and that means that the vulnerability scan will find it but also you need to make sure that for example you understand that port 80 and a 443, 443 are actually expected to be in. For eight, port 80 is, for example, HTTP. So it is, it needs to be open if you want to access to the internet. And then port 1433 is actually the database port. And here it should not be exposed. If you're exposing that port, that means that your company is under risk. So now that we addressed open ports and network vulnerability scans, let's pass to the web uh, vulnerability scanning. And one, and actually two of the most common uh, software that I have been using are Burp Suit, and I definitely advise you to take a look so you'll understand a little bit more how it works, and Veracode. So uh, this allow you actually to go and test your web application security, which is extremely important as nowadays we're going into the cloud. So everything is web-based and ev all the applications are, are, at least most of them, they are not within the in-house server, but they are somewhere in the cloud. And I'm saying somewhere in the cloud because usually when you ask anyone, where's the cloud? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Or they're taking care of the security. So no, they, this cloud migrations is based on a shared responsibility from the cloud provider and the client. So when you have and you're launching a new application on the web based in a cloud server, you need to make sure that you go through a web vulnerability scanning and it will allow you actually to check out the structure of your web applications with different vulnerabilities understand how you can mitigate the risk related to that and one as well one of the 
uh, tools that you should know is actually Metasploit and is actually an automated exploit tool. So uh, just go read about it as well. It's important to know for your exam um, what it does. It, as the name says, as the definition says, is actually try to uh, use all the exploit, all the vulnerabilities that are known. Let's say, for example, zero day vulnerability will be immediately exploited. So this is an example for you. Then let's go into the penetration testing. So the penetration testing will be actually more, uh, I would say, uh, detailed, and it will include different steps. The first will be the reconnaissance. You need to understand what you are testing. You need to pro proceed with network discovery scans, then network vulnerability scans, so you go more deeper in understanding your target. Uh, then, of course, if there is a web application, to proceed with a web application vulnerability scan, and then you can even use use the uh, export tools. Um, and of course, I definitely it's not only because of the CSSP exam, but any penetration testing should actually have this autom automated testing, and then should also have the manual testing, which is very very important to have a complete. Uh, vulnerability and uh, vulnerabilities overview of your network and your systems. So again, penetration testing will include different phases, will include all what we have talk been talking about, and additionally we'll use the exploit tools, uh, as we mentioned, the metasploit, or, and we'll have actually manual attacks attempts. So again, remember trying to understand what's the difference between network discovery scans, what are they? What are the different types? What's the difference between the network discovery and the network vulnerability? As we said, network vulnerability is more is deeper. And what is web application vulnerabilities? Actually, it will not give you the same scans. It's not the same target. Uh, the web application will give you a little bit more details about the web application structures. And then uh, the penetration testing will include the exploit tools and to end with the manual attacks as well. So, and for the penetration testing, you have actually three types of penetration testing that you need to understand and remember. You have the white box, you have the gray box, and you have the black box. So, the black box penetration test will be, uh, for example, done with no knowledge at all of anything. So, it's exactly the same as an external attacker no information about the application, about the network, nothing. And then you have uh, the white box, and the white box is the other extreme. So having, for example, the architecture, having the details about the code, having all the details about the network and the systems. And in, the, in between both, there is gray box penetration testing, which is actually whenever uh, the company or the testers have a little bit of knowledge and they testing as users with some access and not uh, full knowledge about the, the network or the application. So just try to remember the differences between the three of them. Um, in my case, for example, I do actually work uh, with companies where we mix uh, different kind of things. The code review will be a white box penetration testing. Uh, we will do black box testing for a penetration testing on purpose to understand really how was the application working. And of course, the white box penetration testing will allow you to have a greater overview of all the security risk of your network and the application especially coming from a third party, they will be able to assess all the uh, missing points. So then code review, of course, and testing. This is actually related to the inspection of the source code to find the vulnerabilities, uh, to assess, for example, the different inputs, uh, verifications, uh, do the developers actually did the right things that they use or as best practices or they didn't and um, from my experience as well here is something that you cannot forget CISSP or not code review is actually extremely important especially uh, in an area where actually we are 
going for outsourcing and we work with so many vendors where every vendor has different practices and every vendor has different approaches. So as an example, a vendor can tell you, oh yeah, we are using all best practices, but then you realize that uh, very quickly that the password length doesn't correspond to our best practices. Um, so they are, the code review is actually a very important security assessment that would be part for any companies to understand the vulnerability and assessment. Something else that might happen is uh, hard coding emails, hard coding uh, some other information to allow them or leaving even back doors. So that means that the developers will still have access to the application even if they deliver to the customer. So again, very important need to be really taken care of. And then how that works or how should be a code review assessed to different phases. The first one will be the planning, uh, then the overview, preparation, inspection, rework, and then follow up. This is just a very high level uh, information for you. Uh, try to go on uh, more, more details about that. Um, it's also when it comes to really uh, assess an application, uh, it's important that actually the tester will understand the functionalities. So for example, uh, in my case where I had different uh, security assessment, uh, usually we didn't understand the different users, but they are starting by understanding the business application. What is the goal of the business application? Then of course, what are the different access controls put in place? What are the type of users? And then uh, is there any you know, problems with that? Is there any hard coded um, information? Is there any information that actually allows uh, tra the transmission of credential without being encrypted? Uh, what is, for example, the by default uh, access? Like we saw examples where admin was literally uh, clearly accessible. We also saw uh, cases where you could access to some folders publicly because the rights were not put correctly within the code. So you have different kind of things, but definitely a code review is a, a very important as security assessment as well. And then I mentioned OWASP, but OWASP is one of the open web application security projects that gives you a very good overview of the different best practices in terms of security development when it comes to development of applications. But you have also CWE SANS top 25, which also gives you the different, uh, the most dangerous software errors. So it's easy to avoid it. However, when you have developers, first of all, they need to be trained to secure, it, secure coding. And second thing, you still need to proceed with a security assessment. Most of the time with a third, um, a third party company that can give you a completely objective feedback about the status of the code. And then you have different testing as well. You have the static testing, which actually means that you don't need to run the software you just literally go through the code and then the dynamic testing will actually test the, um, the software when it's already running within the running environment, which is really different. And the first testing, and I really like this one, is actually trying to go through the limits of the software. So you stress the software out and find the limits of, uh, of the application of the software. And this is of course important as well because an attacker might actually go through this discovery phase and try to find this limit to use them to shut down the, the application to, to proceed with additional other attacks. So, so make sure that you understand the difference between th the three types. Uh, it's as well can come in the exam. Then you have the interface testing. I, I also like this one because it's definitely important for a good user experience. So this actually will allow you to test the performance of the module versus the interface specification. Of course, when it comes to a software, you always have requirements and specifications from the beginning. So this means that uh, there is a need to test the interface at the end, uh, make sure that actually the specifications are al in alignment with the performances of the, uh, of the application and the software. And then you have the misuse case testing. So I like the picture here because you have a clear 
like physical example so you can relate and understand how it works so it's basically to um, clearly understand what could be the misuse cases like for example uh, a user accessing the bank account of someone else in, in the case of a banking account uh, in a banking software or here for example how a car thief would actually steal the car from a driver so try to understand that uh, it can be as well a good example this now but it's basically misuse case testing will allow you to know the ways that an attacker could uh, exploit the vulnerabilities and the last part which is actually related to security assessment and testing is security reports so remember that after the security testing here and we're talking about technical assessment we're talking about network scanning vulnerability scanning web vulnerability scanning we're talking about exploit tools uh, we're talking about manual attacks all these are actually not uh, words or not actually uh, concepts understood by the management and usually when a security assessment is done and is provided by the third party company is actually for the management, for the organization's management to assess the risk and for them to decide what would be the right mitigation actions. Of course, as well with the recommendation on the report, but they will decide how much budget they will allocate are they actually agreeing on that or are they not agreeing on that? That means that, of course, the security report needs to have a clear view of all the vulnerabilities, how to resolve the vulnerabilities, how much time it requires, what, what are the compromised accounts, the different software flows. But all this means as well that all this technical information needs to be presented in a way that the management understands so this is really for you to and it's the end of our presentation so i really like the picture <laughs> so if you have questions please do ask but basically the security assessment gives the company an overview of all the vulnerabilities and this is related you have the security assessment that are, and reviews can be different types and of course it all depends on the company it depends on the assets of the company but it is important to understand which kind of assessment are doing what and what means the penetration testing that the penetration testing actually is the whole assessment it includes everything and therefore needs to be ended by a report that will be presented to the management and the management needs to understand it if they do not understand it they will not allocate the right budget for the the risks to be mitigated and therefore the company will be actually at a very high risk so here we go so the two uh, domains are done thank you very much for watching this video and good job wow you have made it we came to the end of the course and it has been a real journey so now you have an overview of the eight domains of the cissp plus some of the tips i will be publishing another additional videos about some very point pain points that you need to remember before the exam probably in the next couple of weeks so make sure that you follow me up on peerless.com and get the latest news have a great preparation and keep the faith, keep the hope and just work hard. It will be really a lot of work, but at the same time, it will be a great recognition and we will be all very happy when you pass the CSSP exam. So please make sure also that you share on pillars.com that you have been certified or that you just passed the exam. We'll be happy to celebrate with you. Good luck and talk soon.